Amen. Amen. Great. Um, so uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Privacy and Tech and AI Model Building. So um, a little bit of uh, additional information. So before we get started, so um, I work over at Doc AI. I'm the head of edge infrastructure. Uh, Doc AI is a Silicon Valley based digital health company. We, we build mobile health products uh, that have a, uh, that they work with AI technologies and algorithms, privacy preserving infrastructure. Uh, we work with, uh, with a variety of uh, organizations uh, across the board uh, and including very large uh, um, healthcare uh, organizations. For me, uh, part, of what I, part of what I've done over at DocAI is I started the Federated Learning and AI Privacy Teams uh, built up the initial teams around them. Uh, I also focus on infrastructure related things to, to help healthcare companies adopt zero trust in cloud native environments. Uh, I also do a lot of work in the open source space. So I do a lot of work with Network Service Mesh, which is a uh, CNCF uh, sandbox project and is helping with, uh, with lower level networking and zero trust uh, networking and, and policy. And we're seeing early adoption in both telecom and, and enterprise. Uh, I've also worked in a variety of different areas uh, across the board through, throughout infrastructure. So let's get started. So the, the agenda is uh, we're, we're going to run through a survey. And the survey is going to start off with some AI model building technologies. And then we're going to look at survey infrastructure technologies after that. And then we'll finish it up with a uh, with a short example that uses some of these technologies. So the problem statement, the so when you start looking at what artificial intelligence is, specifically uh, how neural networks work, they they learn to predict their outputs based on their input features. And so you have a set. If you look at the graph on the right, you have a set of, of input features that come in. They run through some set of uh, of network. That network will learn things about the about the input dimensions, and then we'll try to make predictions in the output. So this is generally a good property in that as you learn information about the input, then you can make better decisions about what the output should be. But this also has an impact on privacy. And the reason why is because you're you are literally learning to identify features about your inputs to predict your output. So if you're training a model that has access to sensitive data, or you're training a model which, uh, um, what you're effectively doing is you're training the model to recognize the training set, uh, to recognize properties about the training set. So, uh, the reason that this the reason this happens is there's a there's an effect that is called uh, uh, that is called uh, overfitting that uh, that happens within neural networks. So when you have a given input, you, it's the system is not uh, immediately capable of of generalizing right up front, and there are techniques you can use to help with that generalization, but. Uh, what ends up happening is whatever input you send, it's is going to be what it what identifies. So if you're doing a bunch of inputs, like you're making a, an animal detector, and all you put in is cats, you're probably not going to be able to, to to detect dogs with it. And this particular technique is a form of bias. It's a form of, of overfitting. And to make matters even worse, overfitted models learn too much information about the individual inputs themselves. What this means is that if a if a model were to escape your your environment and end up in the black market, then you don't have a way to remove that model off of there, and people can analyze the model you have and and make uh, and uh, discover information about the inputs, which could be very sensitive could be very sensitive data. So, to give you a visual example, if, if that we the we have two lines in the center, and each of these represent two very simple models. So we have the straight line, which is a more generalized predictor. And then we have the dotted line. And the dotted line is something that has been overtrained. And so the question then is predict where the blue and red, sorry, where the blue and uh, where are the squares and where are the circles? So if, so if you look, you can see has it has the line uh, squiggles around. 
you can you can see where it where it reaches out to encompass a circle you can see where it reaches out to encompass a square and if we were to populate this with the initial training set you can actually see how this particular model has overtrained and in this scenario you can see the the linear the, the line uh, version the solid version is still predicting it's still giving you information about the overall data set and but is also giving you less information about any individual so this means that the very first thing you should do in terms of protecting your uh, your information is you should reduce your overfitting and so there are several techniques we can, which you can use. This is not a full survey of, of how to reduce that, that form of, uh, of bias, but uh, there are tools that are very well used throughout the, throughout the industry that can help you get started. So the very first thing is to realize is that smaller networks learn less information. A network that has 10 nodes or 100 nodes is going to learn a lot less information than a network that has a million nodes or 10 million nodes. And so the, so the first thing you should do is try to work out what's the smallest network that I can provide that still gets me a good prediction, but, um, but isn't, too, isn't too large so that you're not learning too much information about the, uh, about the specific entries within your, your data set. There's other techniques such as dropout uh, that will shut off random nodes within your graph so that th that node will, will learn less information and will generalize a little, bit, a little bit better. You can also train on more data. So if you train on a small data set, you'll learn details about that small, detail, that small data set. But if you train on a large data set, you, depending on the bias within the data, of course, you learn, generally learn less information about any single, um, about any single entry. There's regular regularization techniques that you can add in that help uh, suppress some of uh, some of these overtraining, and of course you also have things like data augmentation, the ability to add additional noise into the system, in order to help reduce some of that bias. Now these are not the only things you should do, and we'll get into more rigorous techniques uh, shortly. So. Another problem that, uh, that we have as well is sensitive access to data. So most models are developed on centralized data sets. So uh, imagine you're creating a model to try to detect uh, some form of cancer. So the way that it typically works is people will gain access through, could be through hospitals, could be through research organizations that have collected this information and they'll centralize all that information into a central repository and that uh, central repository which this is uh, which could have sensitive information is uh, is then provided to a small group of researchers who then can run their ai model training loop and so you can see in the the environment on the right that the centralized data and the ai model training loop are both coupled closely together within the training environment so one of the questions that, that comes up is, what if the parties who own the data do not want to share the information to the central group or to the central authority? So one technique that we have to, to work with this is to use something called federated learning. And federated learning allows you to develop a model without having access to the model directly, but instead you work and coordinate with lots of other agents so that they each train a small part of the network and then they send you back updates. So if you look in the graph on the right, we have three, three stages. We have the first one is the, the model. We have a central model that has some initial predictor that gets pushed out to a remote set of, um, uh, of agents. Those agents have some data that they can train on. Each of them does their local training loop and produces a, produces a new model. Those, the updates to those new models get sent back to the original, to your repository, and that those models then become aggregated. They become, uh, they can be ensembled together. They could also be uh, averaged out. There's various techniques you can use to work out how do you want to join them. But what ends up happening is that there's a way that they, these models can get joined together to produce a, 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 single, uh, a single model or a single set of models. So 
this helps this helps with the with the issue where you might have sensitive data that multiple organizations don't want to share directly with another organization for a variety of reasons and so it still allows you to gain access to train on these models across multiple organizations without owning the data itself without ever having access to that original data um, but even then that's still not a not enough so can we what one of the things is in this in in this uh, problem is that can we model a population without model line, without modeling the individuals in the population because if you recall you still have this problem that uh, that exists you still have this line that uh, that can get created that still exposes information and federated learning by itself doesn't solve that although it is a piece of the step towards removing access and preserving privacy so um, so again, phrasing the question again, can we model a population without modeling the individuals of the, pop of the population? So if you have a sensitive question, a uh, sensitive question can be something like, do you have any history of mental illness in your family? You get a complex answer because there may be legal and social implications. The same may, may be about drug use in the, in the past or, um, or uh, criminal history or, or so on. So these type of uh, sense pieces of sensitive information, if you if you ask this question to a person, you they may choose not to answer it, and you get bias from people who who are more comfortable answering it, or they just may they may lie about it because they want to participate and being seen not to participate, uh, they feel can give can give away information about themselves, so they would opt to lie instead, and it adds in additional bias into you, into your system. So. One of the techniques we can use to help with this is a technique called differential privacy. So differential privacy can be used without machine learning. And uh, what, what we do is we add noise to both the inputs and the outputs. And so I have a very simple example. Let's take that same question that we had before and about whether you have a, whether you have a history of mental illness, illness in your family. And you were to ask this as part of a survey, just a, like a, a written survey. And if you just ask the question, you'll get bias. So what we can do is we can put a person into a, into a private room and there is a non-biased coin that, uh, that, that is there. Maybe the user even provides the coin themselves so they know that it's not a tamp it has not been tampered with. And so what they do is they start, the instructions say you toss the coin. If it's heads, you toss the coin again, which erases the initial answer, and then you answer the question. If the first coin toss was tails, you toss the coin again. If it's heads, you answer yes. If it's tails, you answer no. What this allows the uh, what this allows uh, us to do is it is it adds plausible deniability into the answers. By plausible deniability, what this means is, if you ask the person who filled out the survey, hey, you answered yes. Do you do you um, to this? Do you do you, that means you have this particular condition or you have this, this history. The person can say, oh, no, I answered the coin toss. So it gives them the ability to, to not provide information about themselves directly, but, in, but still gives you the ability to, to find something about the overall population because you know the probability of the, twin, of the, of the coin toss. And, and you're able to then model that into, into your system. So it turns out that this technique you can also apply into, into machine learning. You can apply noise to the input. You can apply noise to the output. You can cap the, the learning rates so that you don't learn too much information on a single pass. And you're able to then quantify how much information is, is been encoded into the system. And this, this actually turns out to also help generalize your model. It's a, it, because you're not learning about information about an individual an individual user in in the same in the same level. So, another technique that we use as well to that is uh, that is related is secure multi-party compute. So, secure multi-party compute is where you have two parties who want to collaborate but do not want to share information. So, what happens is the data is converted into multiple component spaces. So. In other words, A gets turned into A1, A2, B gets turned into B1, B2, and B3. 
And in this graph on the right, we have three separate organizations. We have the, uh, one organization that owns all the circles, one organization that owns all the squares, and a third, com and a third company, which is a, a trusted third party, is, a, is the diamond. So what happens is that the, the components, these component spaces, these uh, A1, A2, and A3, uh, are produced from A, and they get sent to, each piece gets sent to, to each party respectively. Um, and the same occurs with, uh, with B. And they all perform the same computation on the data and but there, which is and what happens is that the the cent, the center graphs uh, the center parts like the one that's perf that's performing that function f is not able to to reason about like what is what is what is a from a one what is b from from b one the same is true with uh, with the square and the same is true for for the diamond but then once you combine the information back together then you can get the result of the of the process without having sh shared the original information itself. Now, there are some limitations to this technique. Uh, in short, if you have any form, and this, this is for uh, more for some of the mathematicians in, in the room, if you have, if you have anything that is, uh, that is nonlinear, then you need to be very careful with this technique. It tends to break. What this means is that in a, from an AI perspective, you're able to you're able to perform the initial the, the initial work on the on the graph. You're able to to do the multiplication and the addition, uh, but if you tie in something like a tangent, then uh, you your output is likely to to break in that scenario. Uh, but branch predictions still work, so this means that you're able to perform your your predictions as long as you stick to things that are that are linear. So this does limit some techniques. Uh, that you can use, but it's still a powerful technique that when your when when your problem fits this this this, this space, then it it is a tool in your box that you can reach for and use. So going on to some of the infrastructure work, there is a environment called a trusted execution environment, and so what what this is is if you look at traditional containerization techniques, you have virtual machines, you have uh, containers, Linux containers that have, that have come up, and all of these are centered around protecting the host, the host operating system from the guest. And so that guest one would, would in most scenarios, would, would have limited to no capability to influence guest two or, or the host. In a trusted execution environment, it's it's about the the op protecting in the opposite path. It's about protecting the guest from a from a host. So, so effectively, trusted execution environments are containers which protect the guest from from snooping from the host. The way that this works is that there is a hardware. There's some new hardware that's gone into the the latest set of uh, of chips. So you have like Intel and AMD and and ARM and so on have the have a way to encrypt the, the memory of the of, of the process. So you're able to create a, what's called a secure enclave. And this secure enclave you can then deploy software into in and say keep it separate from the host because the host and each of the guests are all encrypted with a different key. And it minimizes the performance impact because you're you're not you're you're not uh, doing the uh, the computation on an expensive uh, on an expensive key and its hardware accelerated in uh, in its uh, encryption and decryption path, and the keys are typically stored in the in, in the processor itself or in a trusted chip that's that's alongside the the processor. So, uh, what this allows us to do is that assuming you can attest. The, uh, the, the guest that you're deploying to and guarantee that it is in fact running in a trusted execution environment, it means that you can ship a sensitive workload to a cloud environment and have some protection from the host being able to inspect what's, uh, what's inside of them. There is also a, um, an, another technique that's, uh, that's coming around. So, there, and if you look at how systems are defended against today in, in your security model, 
you have uh, you tend to have something called perimeter defense. The idea behind a perimeter defense is if you look at the top graphic, you have a trusted network with a workload inside of it. This trusted workload is um, it needs to communicate with a second workload that's in a different network. So what ends up happening is th typically these there'll be a secure connection between the two networks that's established, and that that connection will be defended by putting a firewall uh, between the two networks, or they may have a VPN that uh, that allows one network to communicate with another network. So. One of the problems is if the attacker enters the trusted network, then they're typically able to access systems within that trusted network with, uh, um, with very few limitations. And so we see these types of, uh, of attacks go on quite, uh, quite often. And there's some very uh, famous attacks that have occurred where a user is, as where the operator has had some uh, some web service that's exposed to the internet and an uh, attacker will, will end up uh, breaking into that web, web service. And once they have access to that web service, then that web service straddles both the internal and the, and the external network. So they can then scan the internal network and find databases that exist within that and start asking, uh, start to extract information. And there's some very high profile, I won't give names in this scenario, but some very high profile attacks that had this particular profile that have led to very significant uh, breaches throughout, uh, throughout the industry, both within healthcare and, um, and out of healthcare. So what Zero Trust does is it's a different way of thinking of, of how to perform security, where uh, the idea is to minimize your, your overall uh, perimeter to the smallest thing possible for a given set of workloads. So we're not saying there's two trusted networks. Instead, we're saying, I have one workload that needs to talk to another workload. Let's limit the communication to those workloads that are, that are involved, regardless as to what network that they're in. And so the first company to implement this at scale was uh, Google. So af after they were, if, if I recall properly, that after they were attacked by a uh, advanced persistent threat, they decided to move over to this, uh, this approach. And the way that this particular approach tends to work is every workload receives some form of cryptographic identity. It's, uh, you can think of it like a certificate in a web server. When you visit your, your bank, uh, it has a cryptographic identity. So it's the same type of cryptographic identity, but assigned to an internal workload. And when two workloads communicate with each other, they have to prove to each other by showing their, their certificates who they are before that secure connection can occur. Once that secure connection is established, we can then control the communication between them using declarative policy. And declarative policy is basically describing what workloads can talk with other workloads. What messages can you send across the, across the wire, as opposed to a more imperative approach, which say these IP addresses can talk to these IP addresses over this port, which, um, which becomes uh, difficult to manage at scale. And it is how people do it today, but it's a, it's a very hard problem to, to scale up in when you're dealing only with IPs because there's not an implicit relationship between an IP, or rather there is an implicit relationship between an IP and an identity uh, rather than an explicit uh, uh, relationship. So this allows us to decouple and it allows us to work in more edge environments, cloud native environments, groups, groups like, uh, or like Kubernetes where your workloads can spin up and spin down quite quickly. The IPs they receive change uh, on a on a regular basis and they get uh, they get rotated amongst different workloads and so this allows you to and this, to focus on creating your identity based upon what to, what the workload actually is rather than on an underlying uh, detail so preserving privacy itself um, what part of the reason why this is important is because we have a whole chain of things that need to to occur. We have when you when you're building out a, a AI, we or you're building out a model, you need to know it, is where I'm grabbing the data from a trusted environment. Yeah. Am I applying the right type of uh, of 
of uh, privacy into it? Am I adding things like differential privacy? Uh, what type of communication can I have if it's like a federated learning example? How do I how do I know that I'm talking to an entity that I that I trust who's who's remote? So these type of uh, these type of models you can't just focus on on one layer. You have to focus on all of the layers down from the hardware and and what's running all the way up to the actual processes themselves and what's uh, and what's running and what's running on top of them. So. Uh, this means that you have to have cooperation from your from your data modelers. You have to have cooperation from your from your infrastructure team, the people who are building out the pipelines, uh, and the vendors who are selling you the uh, the hardware that this stuff uh, that this stuff runs on. So, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of privacy, uh, we've applied these particular uh, systems to several of our of our products that we have, but we want to focus specifically in this example on the bottom left with uh, with Passport. So Passport itself is a secure application that is designed to allow an, um, to have an employee dashboard that is designed to help teams get back uh, to a shared physical space while simultaneously preserving their privacy. So uh, the way that it ends up working is that there's a series of questions that are that are asked um, that that are sensitive, but are necessary in order to protect the population. And what we do is is these questions get pushed to the phone in the same way. Use the same heuristics, set a set of heuristics. Um, the questions get pushed to the to the phone, and we we then work on that on those set of questions. We never send the the information the the result of any given question to the back to the central location. So the the sensitive information stays on on the phone. And and if they've if they've answered all the questions in a particular way uh, that demonstrates that they are a, a safe candidate to come back in, then they report back saying that that they've uh, replied uh, successfully with to each of the question in a way that is that determines that they are safe and or uh, low risk I should say rather than safe that they're low risk and so we have a, this gives us the, the um, just enough information to report back to the employer and to approve the the person while simultaneously not uh, giving the employer any detailed information about what goes in so it's the sharing a minimum quantity of data back Sensitive, sensitive information itself is not transmitted, and the end result is a cryptographically signed QR code that exists on the phone that they can then show and scan. It says basically, effectively says, "Yes, I answered this. Uh, I answered these set of questions, and have uh, and have attested that uh, that uh, the person is, is low risk." So, on the back end, we also make use of. Uh, of a zero trust environment, and so each each of these connections in the internal system are uh, based upon uh, are based upon Spiffy and Spire. So Spiffy is a CNCF project that describes a set of like how do you give out these identities? How do you rotate these identities? And uh, Spire is the reference implementation of, of the Spiffy, Spiffy protocol, and so. It's a, these both of these are CNCF projects, which is the this which is part the same organization which also manages Kubernetes, so they're they're both uh, they're all sibling projects to each other, and so Spire does the actual work of handing out the identities to the workloads, verifying information about the workloads, what images they're running, what systems are they running on, and then Open Policy Agent is a, a system which you can write declarative policy and that declarative policy is human readable and machine readable so you can say this workload is let this application is allowed to talk to this database and i want them to prove who they are using the identities i received from spire and they're allowed to send these messages and so you can specify the interactions using open policy agent and open policy agent will then read the uh, the input from the request and then we'll give you a decision it's like yes this i'm going to allow this or no i'm not going to allow this and here's why and it gives you that explainability and finally these the information that is necessary to report back to the employer is then sent back to a uh, 
to a metrics and logging infrastructure where the employer can then look in a, in a dashboard. So as an example, uh, it's trying to reduce the, the total amount of information it's sent. It uh, tries to separate out components. The, the policy is separate for, from the application itself and is applied uh, and, is, and, is, and is applied as a um, as a uh, as a uniform thing that you can control with uh, that with Spire giving giving out the the identities themselves. Like the application cannot ask for a specific identity; it gets assigned an identity based upon based upon its properties. Um, with that, as a recap, we want to make sure that we collect less data overall. So when you're building out an AI system or any other system that is collecting sensitive data, it doesn't have to be ML AI. These, these type of, uh, of techniques also work in other environments or in other, with, other, with other approaches. So you want to collect less data overall. Try to collect less sensitive data if you can. Um, exercise good processes for data that was collected. Uh, in fact, part of this is not just about the technology it's also about your internal processes if you have internally if you have if you have good discipline within your processes then this discipline will reflect in your technology and in your and in your choices and will help you identify uh clean lines of ownership and clean contracts and, and all of this ends up uh, it, applying good software engineering techniques will will help you in this path and make sure that you the same way that you have your features, consider privacy as a feature. Don't consider it as a secondary bolt-on thing that you've added. It is a feature in and itself, and it's something that is cross-cutting uh, other features. Uh, design that, design and prioritize that privacy in your architecture. And uh, importantly, do not assume that the AI models or the data that you that you trained on sensitive data is inherently privacy-preserving. So one really famous example of this is if you look at the, uh, the Netflix study that was done in, um, there, was a, there was a Netflix prize that, that was released. And people came up with some pretty, they, the idea was to provide enough information about what movie a user has watched and in order to provide better predictions. It turns out that this data set, uh, when you pair by itself, uh, it was de-identified and by itself, it was, it was pretty innocuous. But when you paired it with information from Twitter, from Facebook, from uh, other social media platforms, then it turns out that there was enough information in there that you could then start to personally identify people and what movies they watch. Like persons might say, I watched a movie tonight and I watched this, or this is my favorite movie and how they rated it. Um, all of this information can be paired with other, with other things. And so if a, day, if a model uh, is, that is supposed to be private is extracted and is, uh, and is leaked, um, make the assumption that people are going to try to pair this up with other data sets to try to reduce the, um, to, to try to reduce the overall privacy. The differential privacy that we discussed earlier helps a lot in this particular space because uh, it turns out the, um, because you because you you have that plausible deniability that's built into it, it makes it very difficult to work out whether some whether some spike in your in your data is real or not. It it reduces it reduces that uh, that privacy leak through through that uh, property. Um, and think about privacy across your whole chain. You have the models, you have your pipelines you build, you have in the infrastructure, people tend to, to separate their infrastructure into three parts. You have compute, you have the transport, the network, and the storage. All of them have to be designed to work with each other. They're not isolated. They're all part of a, of a, of a solution. They're all part of a chain. Make sure that things are designed so that they have clean interactions with each other and can help each other. It can help, uh, they can help defend against each other. Like on the compute side, you you may have a secure storage and a secure transport, but if you have a if you have a bug in your compute and the actual hardware, maybe there's some information that can get trans uh, that can be transported to the side. Things like heart bleed or or similar techniques that that uh, may come out in the future. And so, how do you how do you defend against compute? Well, maybe what you do is you only run uh, processes from a specific user on a specific processor that's been dedicated to them for a specific period of time. And, uh, um, and you don't 
commingle certain types of processes. And so like think of these type of problems. If you're working on data that's not sensitive, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, but if you're working on very sensitive data, start asking these type of questions as to like, what can go wrong in my compute? What can go wrong in my model? How can they, how can they defend each other and cover each other's weaknesses? And finally, I strongly recommend that you engage with open source communities who are focusing on privacy in, in this area. So there are certainly multiple organizations within the machine learning and AI space that are starting to have a focus on this. And this is the tip of the spear. Um, I'm also hoping that, uh, that Linux Foundation, IEEE, and other similar groups start to also invest heavily on not just the security side, like there's a new security organization within Linux Foundation, but also focus on, on privacy because security and privacy are, even though they're related, are not the same thing. Um, private security is very often focused around who's doing what, how do I make sure that only I, an authorized, that I can authenticate and authorize a user uh, and defend and defend things. Privacy is about how do I not learn or how do I not share sensitive information. They're both tightly coupled with each other, but they're they're two side they're 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 two separate orthogonal things that um, that do have some implications with each other. And with that, I want to thank everyone for joining and listening in. And if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to ask here in the webinar while it's on. You can also reach out to me. Uh, I have my name here on the CNCF Slack. If you're not on the CNCF Slack, there's a link there on how to gain access. For information about Doc AI and its products and what we're doing, or if you want to join us in, uh, in producing or building some of this stuff, you can send us an email at info at Doc AI as well, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, have Frederick answer a few questions here. Let me share my screen. Great. So in terms of uh, questions, so let me I'll go ahead and, um, and uh, read some of them. So one of the questions was, what do you do to recommend to assure compliance of AI models with privacy regulations like the GDPR in Europe? So GDPR is, uh, is a very interesting um, um, scenario. So I'm not an expert in GDPR, so I want to be a little bit careful. Please uh, take uh, take in line with take my answer a little bit of a grain of salt and get some expert advice in this area. Uh, my understanding with this from uh, from the privacy side is that if you have data that is uh, that originates from a user, you have to be able to track. Uh, and be able to delete information from that user in specific ways. And there's rules on uh, on who can perform actions as a as a processor of that uh, of that data. And so, in some ways, there, there are some some similar uh, there's are there are some similarities with how uh, HIPAA tends to work within the United States. So like in, with HIPAA, if you want to work, if you want to share some sensitive information to have some processing done, or you, you want someone to work in, uh, in a specific way uh, on some sensitive data, you generally have to, uh, you, you have to get them under a, what's called a, a BAA. Uh, I believe it stands for Business Associate Agreement. And this means that you can audit, uh, you may have to audit the, the, the organization in some scenarios, you have certain requirements in terms of uh, how the data is passed uh, and there's a, a, a legal infrastructure that gets established between between the companies 
And I think that if that with uh, GDPR, if you want to play it safely, it's not just about the technology, it's also about the people. So we want to make sure that uh, that you establish those same type of things. Say like, hey, I have some sensitive data and I'm going to provide you with that sensitive data so you can provide a service. Set up that legal infrastructure so that you, you can ensure that they protect the data as well. And also that if they breach the, uh, the agreement, that they take responsibility for for it as well. That they that they don't just palm it off back on you and saying, "Oh, we were just the we were just the processor." Never mind, you know that the techniques that they used were were not uh, particularly uh, particularly uh, uh, good in that scenario. So um, I hope that answers the uh, the question properly. In terms of another question, uh, have we experimented with homomorphic encryption? So that was a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I have experimented with homomorphic encryption. One of the things that I'm a little bothered with in terms of homomorphic encryption is when you start to do things at scale, it, it tends to have uh, significant slowdowns. Uh, as far as I know, this is not really a, a solved problem. There are some excellent use cases for homomorphic encryption when you have smaller quantities of data, and uh, I would recommend that you make use of those uh, when when you can, if the problem fits. But when you start training on very large quantities of data, then homomorphic encryption starts to um, starts to have some some problems there. And so, uh, my hope is that we in in the future we have some advances in the industry that helps make makes this a, a more uh, a more tractable technology. Um, that being said, uh, there there are certainly areas where it can where it can work out. And so, if if you experiment with it and you see that it uh, that it fits your your problem, then by all means, definitely uh, definitely use it. Um, there's another question about in secure multi-party compute, why is the function f not labeled f1, f2, and f3? Thank you for, for asking that question. It's a fantastic question. So what we want is we want every fun we want to run the exact same function across all three data sets. So we're not deviating the function, we're, we're deviating the data that is sent to the function across the three organizations. So uh, there's this, this is actually a really important point because it turns out that you have sensitivity in the data. Most people focus on sensitive, sensitivity of the data. But what if the algorithm itself is sensitive and can give away information about what you're trying to do? Then in that scenario, uh, secure multi-party compute may not be the right choice for you because you're effectively giving your algorithm to two or three other organizations. And in that scenario, you probably want to focus on a trusted execution environment where you can, where you can send a workload to to a, to a secure enclave, and then you bootstrap it from there. Pull your algorithm using a um, using a, your PKI, your public key infrastructure, and then run it in in that uh, trusted environment. So, and and that can that can give you uh, that that would allow you to deviate the the function itself. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the slides, uh, yes, we can we can post the slides. Uh, I'll make sure the Linux Foundation actually they do have access to the slides, so we'll make sure they get posted out. Um, let's see. There is a there is a question about uh, passport. Um, uh, Melissa or Marina, maybe uh, maybe you want to answer this particular one on, on Passport. Um, basically, the question is about uh, what would the information the employer would be able to gather from the employee's responses? Uh, would it be anonymous? Is it uh, uh, of the help? what gets sent back. Uh, my recommendation is to ask, uh, send an email to info at doc.ai and get you an accurate response because I'm not able to properly answer that specific question. Uh, thank you. Thank you for posting that. 
Um, with that, I think that answers all of the uh, the questions. Other than I don't know when the webinar will be will be posted. I'll, I'll work with the Linux Foundation to to get that out, and we'll we'll put a message on our Twitter when it gets posted as well. I can jump in here, Frederick. Um, yes, so the slides and the presentation will be posted to the Linux Foundation YouTube page, and you can look for that in the next week. Okay, and I'm actually going to switch um, the host over to Marina. She's going to answer um, the passport question. Uh, oh, I, as I was just saying, um, that question probably would be best answer, answered by email. We can follow up in a bit more detail on, on passports specifically. So the, the email to uh, contact us at uh, is info at doc.ai. Okay, great. Is there any other questions? Okay, if we have no more questions, uh, we will close out for today. Last call for questions. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.